In this project, we're going to design a sensor trigger interface that can be used in all sorts of applications, including a drum machine, and we'll have PCBs made by today's sponsor, PCBWay. The interface needs to be designed to use these transducers. Piezoelectric. Or piezoelectric. The transducers have a capacitance associated with them. And that's one characteristic we're going to need to consider in our trigger design. To get started, I'll consider what the objectives are and gradually come up with a circuit to convert the voltage spikes into usable trigger signals. So this is the sort of voltage I'm really going to be dealing with. 20 or 30 something volt spikes positive and a little bit negative. This one gave me a peak of 41 volts and a negative 6.8. So there's multiple peaks here as it rings out, even though I only tried to do one hit. And this is the kind of thing I'd like to filter out. So it really only has one peak detected and maybe tighten it up so I can get multiple hits. Because I will be hooking it up to a teensy I believe the Teensy 4.1 ADC input can be max 3.3 volts, and it can only go down to ground, so I need to make sure this does not exceed whatever analog input I'm using, and doesn't go below ground. Another thing is, these peaks are relatively sharp, so I'd like to actually hold this signal long enough that if I'm reading multiple channels over and over, I want all these signals to be held long enough that I have time to get to them and read them before they drop out. And here's a good example of the capacitance of the transducer holding on to the signal. It rings out, but it's held at a certain voltage. So the first thing I want to do is try to get this to respond a lot quicker and go back to zero. And of course, a 100k resistor is a good place to start for discharging a capacitor. We basically have dampened this signal a bit. So as we continue working on this, it's just going to take care of multiple problems all at once, and we just have to play around with it and see how it goes. Now, the next obvious problem here, we got to get rid of these negative spikes. So I'll use a 1N4148 single diode to rectify this in line with the signal. And I'll add an extra scope probe to look at the signal that we are conditioning. Now when I generate a response, the blue trace here stays at zero or greater. The main sensor can still go negative. There's a double hit. These are about 15 milliseconds apart, but that's really quick, like brrr. So what I'd like now is a peak detector so I can just find the peak and hold on to it for a bit. And at the same time, that should clean up a lot of these spikes here and rebounds because they're getting lost in the peak being held. And a peak detector basically can be made with a capacitor on the output of a diode. So I'm just going to take a 10 nano to ground on the output of the diode and give this a hit. Now that 10 nano is holding on to the peak that occurred right here. And of course the capacitor is slowly discharging and it cleans up all of that. So again, these couple of peaks here were maybe half of a millisecond before it dropped down. And we picked up pretty much the peak here and we held on to it relatively well. But of course, we don't want to hold on to it that long. So I need to add a resistor now to help discharge this capacitor, similarly to the original resistor we added to discharge capacitance of the sensor itself. I chose 10 nano for the capacitor experimentally. Again, we don't want too much capacitance, but if we go too low in capacitance, we're not going to hold the peak enough. I'm going to do a quick double hit just over 20 milliseconds apart. So if I say that I want to detect a peak and then by the time 20 milliseconds has passed, I want this capacitance to have discharged the voltage enough to consider this back to a low signal. So there's a formula, 20 milliseconds divided by 2.2 times 10 nano gives us 909K of resistance. So I'm going to take a 1 meg resistor and put it across that capacitor. Now if I trigger this, so there's pretty much 20 milliseconds apart again. 
So we've already got the signal staying positive, but now we need to make sure it does not exceed a safe level. I'm going to go with putting a 5.1 volt zener across the output of the conditioner as we have it now. So now the level should never exceed around 5.1 volts, even though I'm going into a 3.3 volt ADC on Teensy, I'm going to do some more buffering and control the final level after. So let's see what happens. And our maximum, when we hit this thing hard, it's still close to the 5.1. 5.16. So let's start working on a PCB design for this and get over to the Teensy and start working in that domain. Here's the resulting schematic design. There's four identical stages using a quad op-amp. VCC and ground come in, and there's also a pass-through VCC out, so it can chain to another board beside this one. So just like on the breadboard, we have our transducer to ground here, 100k across it to help deal with its capacitance and discharge it a bit, series diode to keep the signal positive, a 5.1 volt zener to clamp the maximum level of that positive signal, 10 nano along with this series diode to act as a peak detector to hold on to the maximum signal for a bit, and a 1 meg resistor to help discharge that capacitor so it's not holding the peak forever. The op amp is just configured as a buffer so the signal in comes straight out. There may be a little loss from VCC, so the output level may only go so high. The LM324 has a wide power supply range, and right here we can see electrical characteristics, voltage out high. If VCC is 5 volts at room temperature, our maximum output may be 1.5 volts below our 5 volt VCC and we have a maximum 5.1 volt input signal, we may only see 3 point something or 4 point something maximum out because of the nature of the op amp if it's not rail to rail. So already just with that, if I power this from 5 volts and I give a 5 volt signal in, I can almost directly feed this to a 3.3 volt analog input because the op amp itself is going to limit the maximum output. But otherwise, I've got this level output potentiometer here, so I can just fine tune this and make sure I don't exceed 3.3 or whatever the analog input is capable of doing if I change what I'm plugging this into. I've got a series nominal 100 ohms here because it just helps an op amp drive capacitive loads, including if I have any length of cabling and such, but it shouldn't really interfere otherwise with what's going on. And I just threw an LED and resistor indicator on the output here just to help with debugging. For example, if I'm not plugged into a processor yet. Although, of course, you need a certain output voltage here to drive the LED. So I could get a quiet input signal that would register on my processor and it may not turn on the LED. So with all of these passive components here and the fact that everything you add to a passive network is going to load it down a bit and change the characteristics, if I did not have this op amp buffer here and I have other things going on and then it could change the way this capacitor holds a charge and discharges the timing, this helps keep things consistent. After finalizing a PCB design in KiCad, I generated Gerber and drill files zipped them up, and went to PCBWay.com to order boards. By clicking on Instant Quote, then Quick Order PCB, I clicked to add Gerber and uploaded my zip file. The website determined the PCB dimensions and other info automatically, and the default choices were acceptable, so I chose a shipping method and placed an order. I'm going to do a demo with eight drum sounds, so I'm going to use two of these boards and I'm going to power them from 5 volts, and I'm going to chain the power between the boards. Then the outputs on each board go to 8 analog inputs on the Teensy. And for the output audio I squared S board, I'm using an Adafruit UDA1334, and then we only need those three signals. Word select, bit clock, and the data in. 
I'm also going to make use of this digital pin right here on the corner for a certain test mode. When that's grounded, it will just play some drum sounds automatically. Along with the sketch, I've uploaded all of these individual sound sample files. These are the individual volume levels that I want. While we're talking about audio levels, let's come over to this Teensy Audio Design GUI. We want audio ultimately to be output on an I squared S board, and we are playing audio drum samples from memory, and we can have as many of these as we want, so I'll just bring three in for now. I need to go through a mixer going out to headphones or whatever. So if different samples here are at different levels and I want to equalize it out, I'm changing the gain on the input of each mixer channel. And if we were to just export this structure, if we were to take that stuff out of the GUI and throw it into the sketch to get started, we would see things like audio play memory. That's these memory player modules. I decided to use eight drum sounds, and here's the specific analog pins that those are hooked up to. Now, those memory player modules that go into each mixer input, I'm just naming those players as sound 0 through sound 7. So here I have a pointer to a bunch of routines, one to play each specific sound sample. If I loop from 0 to 7, and I want to play back whatever the current loop number is, I can use this pointer, put in the current loop counter number, and it will go and play that specific routine. So then here's the main routine that scans all the inputs. And I commented this fairly well. What I will do is explain with a picture what this is trying to accomplish. When I'm scanning the inputs, this is zero volts, and I call this an idle state. If I suddenly read this and detect it has increased by 5% of the total full-scale 3.3 volts, I'll put this in a triggered mode, but I don't play a sound sample just yet because I want to let this settle. Every time it goes up 5% of the full scale, I will count that level as the new peak. So I get all the way up here, and this is the new peak. Then it starts decreasing. When this decreases by 5% of full scale, I'll consider that this triggering is complete. So now it's time to trigger a sound sample. And whatever this peak was, I will use that to change the volume level that I play the sample at. So now that it's triggered and played back a sample, every time it goes down by 5% of the full scale, I will trail the detected peak down just to keep track of it, because if suddenly we haven't made it all the way to bottom, but we go up another 5% of full scale, I'll consider that to be another valid hit and not just a little noise. So that's why I've tracked my peak. So let's say it's going down. It gets down to here, but then it starts going up. So when it goes up 5% higher than this last known peak, time to trigger again. So it'll do the same. It'll keep reading the peak and store the highest. When it goes down 5% of full scale, it'll trigger the next sound sample again. Well, that was a lot of fun, 
And I learned a few things as usual along the way. Thanks to PCB Wave for sponsoring this project. Thanks for tuning in. If you learned something valuable or just were entertained by this, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you on the next video.